Welcome to Bachelor Party. Today, we have a guest that I've been trying to have on the show for a very long time, so I'm super excited. Today is finally the day. Let's get into it. But first, Election Day is coming up. We're just a few weeks out. It's on November 3rd. And did you know that in most states, you can already vote? If you didn't know this, or if you're wondering if you can in your state, go to BallotReady.org. It'll give you all the information you need and help you make a voting plan. So what are you waiting for? Just get out to vote, whatever state or territory or district of Columbia. There's only one you may be in. In any case, head to BallotReady.org and get the info you need. This episode is brought to you by eBay Authenticity Guarantee. eBay knows that when it comes to jewelry, authenticity is the real gem. When you see the blue check mark that says Authenticity Guarantee, It means your next piece will be carefully inspired by jewelry experts and will always be worth its weight in gold. Whether you're looking to make a statement or build the perfect everyday look, eBay is making sure you get the real deal. With eBay Authenticity Guarantee, you can trust that jaw-dropping piece will always arrive jaw-droppingly real. Ensure your next purchase is the real deal. Visit ebay.com for terms. This episode is brought to you by Visible. Maybe you've already let your New Year's resolution slip. We all have, but you can still make a two year's resolution with Visible. Right now, you can get a one line wireless plan from Visible for just $20 per month for 24 months. 24 months is basically four bachelor seasons. That could be four engagements, four broken engagements, so many other couples we didn't see them coming. It's really an eternity in Bachelor Nation. And that's unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon with no annual contracts. Switch now at Visible.com and use the code Visible24. Don't miss out. Offer ends January 31st. New members only. Promotional rate with service on the Visible plan. For additional terms and network management practices, see Visible.com. Juliet, don't make it sound like I haven't been. We've been two ships in the night. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I am joined by Charlene Joint. Hello, Charlene. <laughs> Hello, Julia. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great. It's great to have you here. Um, we've been emailing, trying to do this for like almost two years. I think it's really my, my fault. Um, I like never give you enough notice, but finally it worked out. You know, now that I'm on the other side where I try to arrange guests, I really feel your pain. And there is Hard. there's just a lot of moving parts and scheduling. And you do often end up being two ships in the night, sort of. Yeah, it's true. Not in the same place at the same time. That's not a thing anymore. <laughs> I, I'm so I know. Actually, where where am I speaking to you from? Where are you? I'm in my New York City apartment. Oh my God. It does. It looks, I mean, people can't see this, but you have like an amazing staircase behind you. It looks like you're in like a Hudson Valley home of some kind. (laughs) It's a very, it's full of character. It's, I mean, the building's over 120 years old, I believe. Oh, wow. So the building has, there's no other apartment quite like it, which, you know, is one of the reasons I love this city. Um, What neighborhood do you live in? Upper West Side. Oh, that's where I'm from. I'm from. You're kidding. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, wasn't it a little sketch? It was. <laughs> yes. It, w- it wasn't really when I was growing up. But when my parents, my parents moved to their apartment where they still live in the mid seventies. And it was like a little sketchy then. Um, and they've been there ever since. And I love it. Love it dearly. It's a wonderful place. It is. I'm amazed. I didn't know you were a New Yorker. Yes, very much so. I'm currently in New York as well. I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, my bad. For some reason, I, I associate you with L.A. I, yeah. I'm sorry. That was such an insult. I didn't mean it. Like- <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just been uh, quarantining in New York because my family's here. But yeah, I I have been in L.A. Um, for almost 10 years. And, you know, it's been like it's like the new hub of Bachelor Nation. So it's been useful for this podcast. <laughs> but uh, I've been I've uh, I love New York. It's, so it's, true. The, it's the best. I um it like usually takes me like 20 minutes to bring up the Upper West Side in summer camp when I meet someone for the first time, which, you know, maybe you find charming, maybe you don't. But yeah, anyway, I'm glad glad that you like it there, too. I think that's very charming. That's I really like this tidbit about you. <laughs> um, Have you seen You've Got Mail? I, I mean, yes, I live on as you do Cafe Lalo. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh, I have a Cafe Lalo mug in the cupboard right now. That's awesome. I have a fun fact, which you could totally ax, but my first job when I moved to the city, I waitressed at Cafe Lalo for two months. Oh my God. That's great. We're not axing it. That is of course, <laughs> for those of you who maybe haven't watched You've Got Mail recently is where Joe Fox and Kathleen Kelly 
um, have their first <laughs> unofficial date. She's there waiting for shop guy or sorry. She's shop girl. She's there waiting for um, NYC one, five, two. And I can't believe that you know their full names from the movie. Most people just say Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. It's my favorite movie. As an Upper West Sider, it's my favorite movie. It's um, great. So anyway, and she uh, brings Pride and Prejudice. And he doesn't show up. And Dave Chappelle is in that scene, which also makes it very special. Wait, he is? Yes, yes he plays Tom Hanks' best oh, friend. His friend. They walk down 83rd yeah. Street together and he exactly. drops him off. Exactly. And then they talk about how pretty Meg Ryan is through the window. Like yeah, exa- the, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Okay, we're we're being very <laughs> Upper West Sidey right it's now. It's <laughs> cool. Let's. I, I love it, but we can move on. Um, Charlene, you were on pa- on Juan Pablo season with Claire, which <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> which probably feels like a different life to you because you have such a full career with your all the pretty pandas website. You have a podcast coming out, and I was just um catching up with your site, and I would. If, if you're open to it, I'd love to talk about like what you're thinking for this coming season and how you're seeing developing your YouTube series versus your written recaps. I started out as an editor um, at the ringer as the managing editor and we launched. And so I'm so curious about like all the thinking and you've just been a part of um, kind of the bachelor recap world for a really long time. And I'm curious, like what has changed since you started doing it and like what has the response been like oh. over the last few years? Oh my goodness, Juliet, that's such that is a question I've never been asked, kind of <laughs> amazingly. But also, I feel like you, of all people, are really qualified <laughs> to ask it because you also have been a fixture. In, Thanks. In, yeah. And it's funny how there's, you know, a hunger for this, <laughs> for, yeah. for analyzing this show and discussing it. Um, I I do think it has changed since I started recapping. And as I've said countless times over the years in my recaps. One of the reasons why I even started recapping was because I felt like there was such, I don't want, I use the word misrepresentation lightly because obviously everyone knows what they sign up for. We, anyone who reads anything about this show knows about that contract and how lengthy it is. But I guess I still felt like beyond the black and white, oh, this person is good. This person is bad. It felt like there were so many little in between things that most people weren't picking up on. And that could just be a sentence starting, you know, with one um, mic quality and ending with another mic quality or a sentence being half uttered in one scene. And then suddenly B-roll is rolling for the other half of it. Just this stuff that subtly can, you know, alter the way we view these relationships and more importantly, the contestants as human beings. And so I definitely think I started writing maybe with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, (laughs) but it's funny how over the years it's become more of a commentary on who is playing what part because social media has become such a major player in the last six years. I know it's, it's pretty wild. And I guess, you know, you say you had chip on your shoulder. Is that because you wanted to explain who you were like outside of the show? Definitely. Partly. I I think, you know, when you go on this show, you don't necessarily think you're going to be um, a person of note. Mm -hmm. I I think that people sort of assume it's like, well, you know what you signed up for. I really I had watched the show, but I didn't know that I would be a controversial contestant or someone who would necessarily get a lot of airtime or any of these things that all ended up happening to me, even though I thought I went in with my eyes wide open and my blinders off and all that stuff. So even though I think what was shown was a facet of who I am, it's in, in no way who I am. Sure. And and I recently learned my Enneagram type. I don't know if you're familiar with Enneagrams. Um, I, I am. What is yours? What's yours? You go first. <laughs> um, I think I'm the protagonist. Is that what the Enneagram is? Oh, I think that might be Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs, I'm an ENFJ. Oh, okay. I'm What's your sure. Enneagram? I'm a four. A four. I think I was a mix of a one and a three now that you say okay. that. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm not familiar with enough to know exactly <laughs> what that means, but yeah. I will go look it up while they're listening. It's no big deal. <laughs> I'm a four, which means, and it totally stacks up. I... I'm the individualist. So I Mm. I really care about being understood and seen. And when I read that, I was like, oh my God, it's so predictable. Of course, (laughs) 
just because I feel like my entire blog is a you know representation of that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, but I, but I think that like one thing that I I noticed about your site when I was catching up with it and it's really grown in the last six years. I mean, you just get hundreds of comments on your blog posts. And so there's a real community of of people around it. And so I think one thing that's cool about blogging, um, and it's like fun to talk about blogging in 2020 because it's like, feels like quaint at this point, right? Like (laughs) totally um, does, but there is still a way to like cultivate a community that is just unique to people who kind of like coalesce around a single topic or interest and then sort of like grow out from there. And that's like, sounds again, so quaint. It's like, yeah, duh, that's the internet. But it, 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 in some ways as like media shifted and like, you know, you're thinking about moving to YouTube and you're starting a podcast and we're talking on a podcast, like those sort of like small, small, really dedicated communities are not as common. Um, and I, I just thought it was interesting that you cultivated it. Thank you. And it really, it's my favorite thing. Honestly, I love my readers so much. Last year I threw a party, like a five. I'm actually not a a party thrower, by the way. I never throw myself birthday parties. Planning my wedding was like the most stressful experience of my life, but I wanted to throw a party to like, thank everyone and, and meet them. And I just love my readers so much. They're all so thoughtful and reflective. And of course they're like, they write so beautifully. And the shift to YouTube, which is something I still like, I mean, we know that the show airs in six days. Like I cannot yeah. sleep. I don't know about you, but I... Because <laughs> you're excited or you're nervous or what? Oh, I'm just dreading it. I I know that, you know, people don't like change for the most no, part. Really and in don't. this case, yeah. And in this case, I love my blog too. Like I like reading over things I've written and and knowing what resonates with people. And a lot of my own writing has been shaped by the people reading it. And I'm so thankful to those people. But at the same time, as I expressed in a recent blog post, which by the way, has now amassed like 700 comments. It's 735. I looked today. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I know that people are not going to like, like it that because it, there, like you said, there is a quaintness to it. There's something old school about a weekly blog post and having this dialogue underneath in the comment sections. And it, my heart breaks to even put a pause on that because I don't know if it will be a long term thing, the YouTube thing. But I must, I'm a people pleaser to a fault, and I just want to make everyone happy. But at the same time, as I expressed in this blog post, blogs are just not easy to monetize. Hard and also hard to do. Like. It's a lot easier to do a podcast than to make a blog post. Indeed. Yes. Like it takes <laughs> a lot longer to write than it does just to make the same point, just speaking it. And I'm just such a lover of the written word. So it kills me a bit, but I, I hate to have to go where the tides are taking me. But, you know, in a pandemic, my opera career is on, it's on a hold. I don't know how yeah. long that will be for. I have to adjust, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot to be said for going where the audience is. And so like obviously you've cultivated an audience, but you probably can grow it by going to YouTube. So I, I'm curious to see how it plays out for you. And like also, <laughs> you know, um it's hard. What you're embarking on is hard. So I'm I'm excited for you. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, tell me about it. Well, tell me how hard it is. I want to I, I this is a genuine question. I'm not you, on YouTube, so I don't I don't know, but like, you know, you're you're a performer, obviously as an opera singer. When you were on The Bachelor, did you feel like you were performing? Like, were, how aware were you of the cameras? You know, I think it's because I'm a performer that I am so against and adamant about acting or performing in any other part of my life. And I, mm-hmm. maybe this comes back to being a four, you know, the individualist. It, I want so badly to be authentic and um, understood. And so I not only am incapable of being someone else based on the scenario. I loathe it <laughs> when other people aren't like that. <laughs> Do you know, does that make any sense? Yeah. So when someone oh, like, yeah, of course. Adjusts yeah. Based, yeah. Yeah. So the chameleon's not for you. Um, I respect it, but I guess because I feel like the whole honesty, transparency, authenticity thing is sort of a dying art. And a lot of our online presences come down to cultivating and curating 
you know, this image of whatever it is we want to be. I guess it's it's almost maybe I'm going against the grain in that. And I just want so badly. I don't know. I sound very idealistic right now. No, no. I, I think it's interesting. Before the before the show starts, I've been having like all of these like very meta conversations about The Bachelor. Some successful, some not. I definitely had some like misfires and things I regret saying. But it's just like, it's just interesting um, to talk about like where this space is and it's just such a weird and it just feels like it's like requisite to say this in every episode. It's such a weird time to have a bachelorette season because it's just like, there's so much happening and I'm curious to see how, um, COVID and quarantine, like make it into the, into the show. Obviously they, they did quarantine before filming and all that. And it was like a closed set and everything, but by any chance, do you watch the great British bake off on Netflix? No, but both my sisters watch it and are obsessed with it. And it's, I just haven't, I don't know why I haven't clicked it yet. I know it's very, it's very soothing. It's very soothing when you can't sleep because you're worried about your YouTube series. You should watch it. <laughs> um, but they uh, they're doing like their COVID season right now, which just started airing on Netflix. And, you know, they like reference how they change things. And ultimately that show is pretty COVID friendly. So um, it it's makes it way its way in. But like with all the kind of media that's coming back and production that's coming back, I'm curious to see like how the moment is refracted or reflected through the show. And I'm, I'm just really curious about the bachelor, not, not to mention having Tasha be the second black bachelorette oh, on the heels yeah. of, you know, um, the bachelor diversity campaign and in this black lives matter movement. So there's just like, it's just a way more freighted season than usual. Yes. And on a show that by the way, usually, as we both know, usually dances around these things and yeah. it's sort of like, yeah. there's n- never any mention of, anything going on in the real world. It's all sort of secluded. And so it's, I'm interested for sure to see. I think it's going to kill it though, because I think people are just chomping at the bit for- I agree. Anything. I think it's going to do really well. It's just sort of like you're home in most of the country, it's getting cold. Like you just stay home and watch television. I, I think I think it's going to do well. I, I hope it does well. Um, were you friends? With- <laughs> it works I, out I, for both of us if it does yeah. well. <laughs> um, question- I bet, I'm sure you have been asked. Were you friends with Claire on your season? Uh, yeah, I do get. I've been getting asked that a lot. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, Claire. I always got along well with Claire. We wouldn't. I wouldn't say she was one of my closer friends in the house, but we definitely didn't have any, you know, beef with each other. Uh, I was. My closer friends were Kelly, dog lover, and sure. <laughs> and and Cat. She left in episode six, but you know these. I never had any, I, it was more so when I watched the season back, you know, Claire said one or two things about me, which is always a little like jarring. You're like, oh, yeah, of I course. thought we, yeah, I thought we got along great. But I think it was more so that Claire and I are just such different people and we come from extremely different backgrounds and, you know, there's only so much you can fill that chasm and try to, and tr- you know, you can get to know each other better. But when you're, when you're working with like six weeks you know, I just gravitated to other people a little, you know, more naturally, but I really have always enjoyed Claire. She's so expressive and she just wears her heart on her sleeve. She's very, um, I've always said this about her. She has like an effervescence to her. Like if a human could be like a delicious, sparkly cocktail, (laughs) that's Claire Crawley. She'd be a peach bellini. It's something, yeah, something just delightful, you know, that's she's, so funny. she's a pleasure to be around and yeah. That's so, that's like, that's a, a great way of putting it. I'm, I, I just think that people who emote are very good for reality TV and like <laughs> the way, obviously, and the way that she does, like, she just really, like, I think wearing her heart on her sleeve is just like the beginning of it. She also like wears her emotions on her face. And like, yep. in just the way that she stands, like if you go back and you watch some of her time on your season, she is sort of like a very physical person in, in the way that like some actresses are described as like great physical actresses or physical comedians. I feel like Claire has that too. Like if she were an actress, that's the kind of actress she would be. And totally. so I'm yes. excited to see how that translates to her being the bachelorette. And it's like, I think that in some ways she's like the perfect bachelorette for these conditions. I um, completely agree. And we're on the exact same page. I really appreciate what you're saying about that. Just sort of the, em- the emoting and the yeah. physicality of her. It, I, it always, I kind of roll my eyes when they're like, oh yes, this is, a, she's going to be a great bachelorette because like she knows what she wants. It's like, okay, 
Well, we know that nothing about this process really lends to truly finding your best match based on you knowing what you want. Like you can't, there's nothing that supports truly finding something that can, you know, survive in the real world. So what it is, is entertainment. It is a, a show. And what you want, like you said, is someone who just is. Yeah. There's, there are no veneers and I really enjoy that about her. Yeah, yeah, we're on the same page. <laughs> I'm, 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 ex- I'm definitely excited about it. Um, why did you go on the show? By the way, if, <laughs> just, if you're just curious. Uh, I went on the show because I was 28 at the time, newly single, living on a different continent, doing what I had been pursuing for my entire adult life, and in, extremely unhappy. And you were in Germany, right? I was in Germany and I was in a fest contract, which is a fixed contract in an opera house there. And I was doing all the things you should do as an opera singer to build your career and build your repertoire and build your connections and get performing experience and all the things. And I was lonely and unhappy and questioning if I had pursued the wrong field and my boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend was in London and we were sort of on again, off again. And you know, you're nearing 30 as a woman, you start to think, oh my God. Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm so old. How will I ever make it past 30? Which is now hysterical. But yeah, I had a moment where I thought, fuck it. You only live once. I have extreme YOLO and FOMO in all arenas of my life. And so I had the opportunity to go to the casting call and it kind of snowballed from there, honestly. (laughs) Um, Just a personal aside. I have found that FOMO is worse in quarantine in a really weird way than like in regular life. If if I see anyone doing anything and I'm like, well, I've been doing nothing. I am doing nothing. I'm just like, what is this? Like, why am I not involved? Have you felt (laughs) that way as well? I think... I feel the opposite, but to a fault, like my FOMO is it's dangerous because I'm already kind of introverted. And I, I do it depending on the situation when there are a lot of people, I have a kind of, I get kind of anxious in large social gatherings. And I don't know the, when I, I kind of feel like it's such a, it's an excuse. I mean, it isn't an excuse. It's a good reason, but there's yeah. also this sense of like, eh, <laughs> COVID. <laughs> like, I don't think I'll get out of my pajamas tonight. <laughs> and and then you sort of become less and less of a functioning human in society. <laughs> I think, I don't think my way is any, is better, by the way. <laughs> sure. Well, this is, a, this is no judgment. I think also like in COVID, whatever you do to cope is like, you know, makes, makes a lot of sense for, if it works for you. So I'm just, I'm curious. I was just for, for comparison sake, since you were saying yeah. you made your FOMO and YOLO energy. Well, yeah, I actually find that because of my personality and I I think I've sort of gone into escapism a bit. Like I've really been getting back into video games and I've been reading more books nice. than ever before and just being a complete, <laughs> a complete hermit. But that's not good. I, I think I do think socializing is almost like a muscle you need to flex. And when I have been social, I I've caught myself like feeling like, oh, yeah, you're like, oh, is this what too is much this? eye contact? Yeah. Like, have I been talking about myself too much? <laughs> um, I, I, I have some more bachelor questions, but first I just need to ask you, what are you reading? What have you been reading? Oh, you clearly, is, I could tell from your writing that you read a lot. So I'm curious. I don't read as much as I should. I'm, I'm no Ashley Spivey. There's no but... should. There's no should. It's just whatever. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, I have... Am I allowed to talk about Trump? Oh, sure. Of course. <laughs> uh, I read Mary Trump's book. I'm now oh. on to Melania and Me, which is written by Stephanie. Uh, yes, that's the subject of a Stephanie lot of news Winston stories. Book. Yes. Uh, I'm enjoying that one quite a bit. How to Do Nothing. Okay. I heard that's good, by the way. How to Do Nothing. Uh, yeah, it's... I really enjoy the premise and I, I want to be her friend. I'm finding the writing style... Uh, um, it's not, and I don't even need linear writing, but I, I find it a little, it goes on journeys, <laughs> but it's really beautifully written. It is exquisitely written, honestly. So oh, non-fiction. And also the ethical slut. 
because oh, wow. I've, I've been doing, I've been reading a lot of relationship books for our podcast. So, um, do you mostly read nonfiction? You know, what's funny is normally I read fiction and I struggle with any book that is not fiction, but in quarantine, I've been, I don't know. Everything's all topsy turvy. Everything, I know right everything's actually. upside down. It's like, tell me about you. What, what have you been Mary reading? Poppins. I just read the glass hotel. Okay. Um, by Emily St. John Mandel. It's good. I loved Station Eleven. I liked that more than this one, but it's very good. Um, I also read um, The Vanishing Half, which is a big book. That was a big book this summer by Britt Bennett. That was very good. Recommend? Um, yes, for sure. Okay. Um, I just read a, a kind of uh, a lighter book. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with The Glass Hotel, but it's basically kind of there's a Bernie Madoff situation, and then The Vanishing Half is about race and passing. It's very good. I read okay. a, a lighter book as well called um the forgotten letters of esther durant by katie nunn which i had a great time it was just like uh, okay. a very i mean it's a different you're flexing a different part of your brain when you read that versus the vanishing half or glass hotel but very good um, okay and if i also i don't i don't know if you're interested in this but if you have any interest in the royals i really recommend um the royal we and the sequel which just came out the air affair very very good light reading so okay yeah. wow you really gave me the full spectrum there well <laughs> i just want to give a, you know a full, a full portrait of what you could be reading in, in these uncertain times you know i think we've covered it from trump biographies and tell-alls to um weighty fiction to uh royal fanfic which i am <laughs> i am very much here for so yes yes so do you are you typically a reader that do you always read a lot yeah, I love to read. Love books. Um, I was I, I like get irrationally excited when people on the Bachelor reference books or like what they're reading. I'm just like, this is great. Tell me more. Um, and also, I like when you see people reading on the show because like there's not a lot to do. So yeah. Or, so I've been told. So well, like, you know, I've you're not allowed to. Can you read books though? Like when you're traveling? Um, I was allowed to buy a book. I was, I ended up buying two books like at airports, but they tell you not to bring books onto the show, but then they kind of turn a blind eye when you're at the actual airport. How do you fill all that time? Like, I know that you write about the girl <laughs> chats, like the other stuff that you do in downtime, but like, what do you do all day? Well, that's a great question, Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're inclined to paint your nails and talk about, you know, which hair products are the best, but they often bring it back to the bachelor and make you talk about whatever drama happened at the group date the night before. And so, you know, you would love to turn off your mind and not be a part of that's, that's why in my recast, I do talk about how it always bleeds into the house. You might think, Oh, just rise above it. That drama doesn't involve you, but it does. It does right. become your problem. And it right. makes what's already a sort of tense living situation unbearable. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. All right, it's official. I think I've discovered the ultimate coupling of all time. Like any good relationship, they really balance each other out. One is super sweet, and the other, well, they can be a little nutty sometimes. It is, of course, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. So perfect, some would call it true love. Find Reese's now at a store near you. This episode is brought to you by Visible. Maybe you've already let your New Year's resolution slip. We all have, but you can still make a two years resolution with Visible. Right now, you can get a one-line wireless plan from Visible for just $20 per month for 24 months. 24 months is basically four bachelor seasons. That could be four engagements, four broken engagements, so many other couples we didn't see them coming. It's really an eternity in Bachelor Nation. And that's unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon with no annual contracts. Switch now at Visible.com and use the code Visible24. Don't miss out. Offer ends January 31st. New members only. Promotional rate with service on the Visible plan. For additional terms and network management practices, see Visible.com. This episode is brought to you by eBay Authenticity Guarantee. eBay knows that when it comes to jewelry, authenticity is the real gem. When you see the blue check mark that says Authenticity Guarantee, it means your next piece will be carefully inspired by jewelry experts and will always be worth its weight in gold. Whether you're looking to make a statement or build the perfect everyday look, eBay is making sure you get the real deal. With eBay Authenticity Guarantee, you can trust that jaw-dropping piece will always arrive jaw-droppingly real. 
Ensure your next purchase is the real deal. Visit ebay.com for terms. I can't, I can't even imagine. What was it like having roommates? I feel like at, at 28, <laughs> when you've been living in Germany and like had a, a have a real, um, yeah, I was living by myself. Career. Yeah, I assume. What was it like to not only have like housemates, but like little roommates and be around people all the time? It was definitely a bit of a crash course for me because I never really had a normal college experience. I went to music school and it, and typically these conservatories don't have dorms. Right. And it, it was a crash course, but I am so Canadian that I think that I I was like, oh yeah, you, you can go. Yeah, you can use that. I, I think probably to a fault, but it wasn't that bad. Like if you're just a mutually respectful person, but I granted I was in the mansion in the room that had only four girls and that's nice. another room. Yeah. Claire's room had six and then the blue room had eight. And so maybe if I were in the room with eight people, I wouldn't remember it quite so smoothly, swimmingly. Were you able like on nights when you were not in like a cocktail party and not on a date, were you able to just like go to sleep when you wanted to, or did you have to stay up late to like be a part of, you can drama? never go to sleep pretty much. If this was like an infographic, it's like you just always end up at, you could never go to sleep when you want to go to sleep. Apparently, <laughs> unless you are Corinne. Yeah. And you in, can just nap. Yeah. In which case, again, you're making it everyone else's problem. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln took naps. Michael Jordan took naps. <laughs> I believe that's what she said. Yes. Oh my goodness. That feels like also a different lifetime. Um, what do you think is like the top thing production will have to change to make the season work? Like what all right, what when you heard they were doing it at one location, outside of the travel, obviously, like what will have to change for Claire and Tasha? Oh my God. That's that's both that's a deceptively simple question. Well, there's like so much that goes into it. I think that's one of the reasons why there's such a um, economy and industry around like bachelor recapping and bachelor behind the scenes is because making television is complex. Like it is a hard thing to do. It requires a lot of people and strict schedules and everyone has a role and they know what it is. And production is difficult. And I, you know, there's a lot of flaws with the show and how it's done, but they make good television. And that is definitely a skill. And I'm just curious. And, and they also like, it's a machine. They just do it like cycle after cycle. They know how to do it. So I'm curious but like, with variation. what will have to change. Yeah. Well, I almost feel, and I'm not, I swear I'm not a bachelor conspiracy theorist. I'm not, but I'm I not, feel I'm not either. That, I used to be, but I'm, I'm no longer. <laughs> That's funny that you used to be what happened, what changed you. I think that as you just, um, I think you're interviewing me. I, um, <laughs> I think that as you talk to more and more people, and this also just comes with like having more jobs, right? you realize that a lot of what seems like a conspiracy is often just like incompetence or poor communication. Um, and like there's, it's more of like a, a lack of something happening rather than like an intentional, um, yes, that's well put like, motive. And so I think often something seems nefarious, but it's actually just like inept. And mm-hmm. I think, <laughs> yes. I, I, I don't know if that's completely applies to the bachelor. I think a lot of what people say about the way that, and that you've talked about like women and men, the, the contestants, are sort of, um, like manipulated for a desired outcome for television is happens. It also happens on a lot of reality TV, not just the show, but I, I don't, I don't think there's like huge conspiracies. Like, you know, even though they haven't acknowledged Tasha as the bachelor, I don't think that like, this was the plan all along. I think they planned on Claire being the bachelorette and then it didn't work out the way they wanted. So they brought in Tasha. That's my take, but I think people are already debating that. Yeah, I I fall somewhere in between on that. And again, I'm not a bachelor conspiracy theorist. I really am not. And I I simply feel that no matter what we knew this season was going to need something. You know, there's it's pretty bare bones. They are stuck in one place. And already the tropes, you can only use each trope twice max before. Sure. It, becomes unusable. And it's funny with these greatest seasons ever, you look back and you're like, oh, that was so quaint. And I I loved Alex Michelle's season and thought it, found it fascinating. But at the end of the day, that wouldn't fly today because people would probably be bored, sadly. Uh, I, I found it boring. Actually, last year. Yeah. Last year I went back and I watched a ton because I did a ranking of all the seasons. 
And I, I would like fall asleep during Alex Michelle's episodes a lot. I, I rewatched wow. them. Yeah. Juliet, and Trisha too. I know. That's fascinating. I'm interested. Okay. And, and why can can you, why did you fall asleep? <laughs> um, well, it was late on a Friday and I, you know, working's <laughs> exhausting, but no, um, I think because I, I think because of the reasons why I think Claire has been on the show so many times, they didn't have that early on. It was like the concept itself was enough to draw an audience and just to be like, this is bonkers. But yeah. um, I think in some ways, like the women were like s- these like substantive people who weren't trained and hadn't grown up watching um, this way of kind of living out how you're feeling. Like, I mm. think like it's natural to keep your feelings inside. They incur inside and yeah. like the manifestations of them on, it's different for every, for different people, for people for whom they're more dramatic, they are good reality TV people. And that's one of the things about Claire. And so that the show kind of like lacked the, uh, the emotive quality that we were talking about. And I found that boring. I also found Alex's att- attraction to Amanda. So obvious that yeah. <laughs> I was just like, okay, he just wants to sleep with her. I get it. Like he's a guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And most so, men, yeah. Most men in yeah. his situation would want to. Um, I think we might watch the show slightly differently, but I really respect that. I <laughs> agree with you, like on the emotive aspect, I think, and this is a similar reason to why I liked Lauren Burnham on Ari's season. And that was a very unpopular opinion. I'm used to having unpopular opinions though, when it comes to this show, I I almost relish watching the uncomfortableness of Mm. someone on TV. And I, I was that person and you were not that, but you, that did not come across when you, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but really, I think you came across as a very, as at the time, very strong and, um, with a type of certainty that just having, you know, know a little bit about you, I think just comes from like a certain type of life experience, which is like, you know, living in a foreign country, multiple foreign countries and doing the, um, you know, having this career and having like a really specialized skill. And I don't think you came across like Lauren Burnham at all, even if you were uncomfortable at the time. I guess I thank you. I I guess, except I did like Lauren Burnham. I, I feel like it's more <laughs> just ha- <laughs> I, I, that was an accident. I accidentally dissed her, which I didn't mean to do. I actually truly enjoyed watching her. I enjoyed watching her reticence mm-hmm. in, in a way. And I don't think that works for a lead by any means, but I think no. for a contestant, especially a contestant who is a major player who ends up in a roundabout way, quote unquote, winning. Right. Uh, it's, you know, I find it fascinating to watch that person sort of like squirm uncomfortably because I just think it says a lot about that person versus the person who is. And of course, the middle ground, the ideal is the person who is themselves, but can also emote. That's the yeah. dream. Yeah. But I would much rather watch a Lauren Burnham or even these women from Alex Michelle's season who were like you know, they would, you would see there, they would kind of notice these cameras and sort of shift uncomfortably. And there was this ever present awareness of these cameras and just how strange everything was. I don't like it when any contestant pretends that nothing about it is strange because right. everything's strange about this show. Right. Right. Interesting. Anyway, that's, that's my uh, case. <laughs> do you, do you like British comedy? I, okay. That's a nice segue. I see where you're going with that. <laughs> this, that's almost too squirmy for me. I, I enjoy <laughs> it, but I it's so squirmy. That's why I was wondering, like if you watch the original office, oh, it's so I'm uncomfortable just thinking about it. Yeah. It's like hard, it's hard to get through, but that's, that is interesting. So like, do you respond to like the boundary pushing, I guess, of, of, and, and not even like in terms of like the genre or like what's okay and what's not okay, but like people's like personal levels of comfort and discomfort. I guess so. Maybe that's, wow. Did you ever study psychology or anything there? No. (laughs) These are interesting segues. Um, I think maybe you're onto something with that. There is sort of, you know, I believe that you can tell a lot about a person by the, the things that are not said. And I I talk about in the recaps, like the in-between moments and it, sometimes someone's like I said, reticence to emote will tell you more about them than them just emoting. But again, I don't think that really works that great for a lead. <laughs> no, it definitely. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, of who did that. And I, I think like the person who's the most like themselves, but also also emotive 
and, and just the, a being a motive is not the same as being emotional. Motive is acting out your emotions. Yes. Um, and Ashley, I is like the best example of like, that's who she is. She felt passionately about Jared. She pursued it. They're now married. Yeah. Good on her. Good on them. That's I think the best case scenario. Ashley, I is that golden, that what we're yes. talking about the dream. Yeah. Ashley yeah. eyes the dream because you don't, I believe every single fucking tear that came out of her. 100%. Eye. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. We watched Ashley grow up in real time. It's like weird <laughs> to see that. Like you're used, it's like, it's like we've grown up with like the Jenners and Ashley I Kennedy. And that's what she was hoping for. So, you know, <laughs> it worked she, out in her favor. I think she really is, was masterful. And what I love is that it wasn't even, maybe part of it was intentional, but the result really wasn't from her plotting anything. It was, she yeah. was just herself and it was just that she had all these perfect traits and ways of expressing her feelings. Oh, she was just great TV. She Ashley really was. I, the she dream. really was. I know. <laughs> when they left her in the bat on the Badlands and the rock, that was just so crazy. Yes. So mean. Very memorable. Um, <laughs> we haven't answered the question though. What's going to have to change about this season? Oh, so... I personally think it's going to be, first of all, they can't, I hope that they try not to tiptoe too much around the, <laughs> the, div- the diversity issue yeah, too much. So. I really, you know, when we had that recap of Nick's season, I was reminded of how fantastic Rachel was on that season, just in terms of the conversations that were had and how refreshing they were. Yeah. And I really hope that that, happens at all. I, I don't even think I have particularly high expectations, which means that if they don't meet them, then that's disappointing because I don't think we need that much to feel satisfied in that department. Yeah. You, I, I agree with that. I think, um, I think part of what the show needs to change is, um, not only through casting, you know, this comes for like, I think this is part of a discussion for a lot of companies about like how all sort of like workplaces and, and, um, entertainment, diversify, not just like in a um, performative way, but like long-term is it's not just about like, um, you know, casting Matt moves. James. <laughs> yeah. It's not just about casting, but about the conver- like the conversations you're portraying and, and, yes. like, and like the types of emotions you're portraying as well. I'm very excited about Matt for just for the record, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but it is also about talking about it and like hopefully hearing about, um, Tate's experience as, you know, a woman of color who's the lead and, and for, and for everyone involved, like talking about like real issues that also like people in relationship space, like, you know, you talk about race, you talk about your families and like what their expectations are exactly, and, and all of those things. So, yeah, I think that's what bugs me is for all the discussion there is about how far along the falling in love scale you are. Like you said, there are none of those these normal conversations that would happen. What I wouldn't want is for it to feel like, let's talk about race now. You're a person yeah. of color. Like, let's hear your perspective. It just let it happen, which is how it would hopefully happen in real life. That's certainly how it has happened in my life. And so it, th- I guess that's all I want. Like, and it comes all the way back to that authenticity thing. It's instead of showing us all the things you're doing, just let them like allow yeah. them to happen because they would happen if these were real conversations with real people who were actually ostensibly going to end up engaged. They would talk about. Yeah. And these things yeah, outside of Juan Pablo, who might honestly don't have high hopes, but um, I guess including Juan Pablo, you know, why, why cast him aside? Juan Pablo and production included when you were on the show, did anyone ask you about your background, how you felt being on the show and, you know, not, you know, in, you just have a, um, just professionally, let, let alone just who you are as a whole person, just different than a lot of people on the show. And like, did, was that something that people were interested in talking to you about to like understand who you are? Um, I, I, I'm pretty careful to, I, I will say that in my experience as a, you know, quote unquote person, I, I learned on here to make friends that the proper term is biracial non-black person of color. <laughs> it's, it's a mouthful. But that apparently is what I am identified as. And in that scenario, I really didn't have any bad experiences. What I did notice is that, you know, Juan Pablo and I did talk about my ethnicity and my 
my mother's heritage and things like that. And I do think it's interesting that that kind of thing wouldn't be aired. Yeah. I would have loved to have seen that. I, I, I yeah. just like knowing about people's families just in general. I'm just like, it's such a, it's cool to know where someone comes from or, or you yeah. know, if, if, they're, if they're comfortable talking about it, not everyone is. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that that's important too. That's a good point you make is that not everyone necessarily wants to have that conversation, especially if they haven't really thought through their thoughts on it and their answers. But yeah, it's a shame that, and I honestly didn't even really notice it at the time, but when all the sort of Black Lives Matter diversity campaign came out, I did really, you know, I, I guess I'm not, ex- how do I word this? You know, it's not like any other woman, it's not like her talking about how her parents are German and French yeah. or whatever is going to be aired. So why, why should I expect me talking about how my mother's Chinese to come up? So maybe that's, I'm expecting something that, isn't necessary. But if we are going to touch on that topic that I, you know, like you said, I didn't look like anyone else on my season. Yeah. And certainly for historically (laughs) on any seasons and it was just sort of rarely mentioned. Yeah. But I, but I think to your point, even if it doesn't come up earlier, we often, you know, usually it's a lot of white people. So the stories that you get on hometowns, um, are not necessarily ones about diversity or biracial people or, you know, but I do think there is, there is a space to, to, to have some of these conversations and they often just, just aren't had. Yeah. Rachel seized that space perfectly. Yeah. To, in well, my Rachel, opinion. Rachel is the best. So yeah, she is the best. <laughs> and to answer your other question, we're going to like, just to circle back one step when you said what has to change and then how I'm not a bachelor conspiracy theorist. I personally think the Tasha thing, while I, I think it was as much something that happened to them as something that they made happen. Mm. And maybe that will be an unpopular opinion. Interesting. And maybe I'll, I will feel differently when we watch it play out. I find it just a little too, it's, it's awfully convenient. Sure. Interesting. That the, what would you would expect to be the most uneventful season just in terms of bells and whistles would also mm-hmm. happen to have a lead switch. It's just, you know, well, that worked out. <laughs> right. That's interesting. Charlene, I like it. I'm going to think about this a little bit and also be <laughs> watching with an attention towards this. It's a, it's a good point. I mean, it, it really is. And something that Rachel's pointed out several times is they had the opportunity to cast Tasha as the bachelorette previously and did not. So sort of like, why now? Yes. And if there's one thing I know about Claire, you know, this is someone who Again, I adore Claire. I think she's great TV. But if we're talking about someone who on her first season of Paradise was portrayed as talking to a raccoon. And then... Still came back on the show. Still came back on the show. I think that that says something about either her willingness to get over things or to be uh, convinced of things. I... You know, these all these are little building blocks to lead to lead towards my ultimate opinion on this. And I can I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to picture a producer saying, well, I noticed you have a really, really strong connection with him. I do think you'll be able to give the other guys also a fair chance. And then from there, just for it to progress naturally. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Like there was an opportunity and they went down that path instead of yes. forcing it into the usual structure. Yes. When traditionally what they would have done was sort of not given her a one-on-one day with him for four or five right. weeks. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is, um, well, Colton he, famously said that about Cassie, didn't he? Yes, he did. And I also think Peter and, Ke- and Kelly have kind of been alluding to something there as well, where yeah. I think he recently said that he said that the producer's told him that Kelly wasn't interested in him. Very interesting. Yeah. So it so it's worth noting, like, why then was Claire allowed to waltz off into the sunset with... Don't say his name. Day? Oh, sorry. No, <laughs> you can bleep it's that. Okay. No, it's, we're trying to go spoiler. That, yeah. obviously, I know. I'm trying to go spoiler-free on Tasha's portion of this. Yeah, like I, same. I I hate spoilers. I too. love reality, Steve, but I try. It makes recapping a pain yes, in the ass. I know. Yes. If, if nothing, if nothing else, it makes recapping very hard. And part of the fun is experiencing it along with everyone else. I was saying this on Tuesday with my previous guests. Like, I just want to be a part of the watch. I feel like 
communal <laughs> experiences right now are so hard to really feel because you can't do things in big groups. Like I so miss going to theater. Like I, I actually, I had a flight a few months ago and I was like, loved being on the plane. Cause I was just like around strangers. I was just like, this is so nice. We're all experiencing something together and we don't even oh, know each other. That's so sweet. What a sweet way of looking at that. Most people are like, stay away from me. And you're like, we're on a plane together. I like found it very nice, but I really miss like going to a bookstore and sitting there, going to the theater, going to a movie, like things like that. So like, I want to be a part of like the bachelor viewing public. So I'm just like, please don't tell me anything. I on believe me, I'm on the same page as you. And for some reason, the occasional person likes to DM me oh, I know. the the ending, you know, on ep- during episode four or five, like halfway through the season. And I just I hate those people. Why? Why do that? I know. <laughs> why? Why? Do why that? go but, out of your way? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. What are some other bachelor conspiracies that you're like? Actually, I, I think there's some truth to that one. There aren't a lot, a lot of them come out after the season one or the other. Yeah. Especially as more and more former contestants and former leads, you know, sort of just sort of, yeah, they have podcasts and YouTube channels and all these things are coming from the depths. And it's interesting to see what everyone's getting away with. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, you can speak to this. What, what was it like for you after the show when you were thinking about your next steps, um, in your career, both as like, you know, Charlene, the public person who is an opera singer, but also has just been on television. What was your relationship like with production and how, how much did you think about how your relationship with them should factor into your next moves? I don't think I can answer that in a satisfying way because I met my now husband two weeks after my season stopped airing. And the reason I say that is because you're really, you know, the bachelor world is based on love. If bachelor pad still existed, <laughs> you know, that's a different story. Best show ever, by the way. So anyone. good. It's on <laughs> HBO max people. You should watch it. <laughs> oh, is it on HBO max? Oh, yeah. that was where it was at. Oh, bachelor pad. I always need to take a moment. A different time, <laughs> a different time, <laughs> but truly really gets to the heart of what's what I think reality television should be about which is that competition aspect, which the, the forcing the love narrative into that competition aspect doesn't work, especially when in the same breath, you're talking about how it was always meant to be and you were always going to pick them. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, of course. Like, but when you're competing that's for- That's interesting. That's, that's really interesting that, that you like competitive reality shows and <laughs> well, I'm The Bachelor because it is a competitive reality show. I'm sure everyone's competitive on it. That's where the drama comes from. But like- a lot of people don't say that, right? They're just like, I'm just here for Peter. Like, what's wrong with that? Or I'm just well, here for whomever. Well, that's, I I actually don't like it when the dialogue is too much around it being competitive. And I say that because I have been there and did not feel a sense of competition with the other women. And it wasn't because, it wasn't because I, it, that's just how I am in romantic relationships, if that makes yeah. sense. It wasn't because I thought they were not competition. I certainly f- felt Juan Pablo probably was feeling more strongly for Nikki and for Claire than he was for me. But I nonetheless in for me psychologically and in in terms of a romantic relationship, the kind of person I would want to be with would, how do I word this? I I don't, I would, I never feel a sense of competition in relationships. Yeah. That's just not how I am. It fits or it doesn't. Yes. And I think that that only clouds the results on that Mm -hmm. show, especially on Bachelorette seasons where guys tend to be the more assertive ones and competitive. But I really love it when there's a clear prize. You know, it's not sure. It's not someone who. Sorry. Should you go on Survivor? I can't because I'm. Oh, well, now I can't. Trust me. I would have got, I would have applied for Survivor by now if I could, because I love Survivor. And in the past, I wouldn't have been able to because I'm not an American citizen. Oh, but Is it I'm Americans only on Survivor. Well, until recently, but. My sister now is a producer on Survivor. She and, is? Yeah, my little sister. Oh so, my goodness, that's awesome. Yeah, unfortunately it would not, I wouldn't be able to be a contestant because of Damn. that. Damn. Yeah. Sadly. Too bad. But I have played Survivor Brooklyn and I also played Survivor in Central Park. Like there's, people will organize, the first really? one was organized by Zeke. 
Do you know, Don't. um, he was, I forget which season he was on, but he was a former contestant and he hosted oh. a survivor at his apartment in Brooklyn. And I spent the entire day in his apartment with like 20, 25 other oh contestants. And we spent the entire day, like 10 AM till like 1 AM. Oh my God. The more the challenge is like, <laughs> what, what did it mean to survive? What did it mean to outwit, outlast and outplay? There was one where we had to like throw ping pong balls into these solo cups. Another one where it was sort of like you were with hunting deer? for Easter. Uh, probably. And there was another one where you had to build the highest uh, house of cards. Another one where you had to, it was like Easter, an Easter egg hunt, but with marbles on, on the building's rooftop. Which I won, by the way. Congrats. Uh, <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, that's, it was fun. That's really cool. That's really, really cool. Wow. <laughs> so do you watch Survivor? Yeah, of course. Love it. Look, of course you do. I always You're so it. cool. <laughs> I, t- <laughs> I took a few seasons off, but I got I was back in on season 40 and I'm going to continue to watch. Um, I, I like a lot of the like more old school reality shows. I mean, of course, I watch basically everything. And right now in particular, and I devour like all Netflix programming and their reality is really good. But um, I've recently on YouTube gotten into like revisiting some classic real world and road rules moments from like the pre-internet era. And that's wow. like, really fun to go back and watch because it's just like, it's just different. It was just like before there was market saturation and it was just, a, it was just a very different era of pop culture and television. And of course, like people just now literally grow up with reality TV. It's like a fact. It's not new to the TV ecosphere, but yeah. Back then, it was like this really weird thing to do. Yeah. Now it's not. Nope. <laughs> Although I still don't understand how employers give people time off for like Survivor. I mean, it's, The Bachelor is different, but like for Survivor, you got to get 40 days off and you might not like, I mean, maybe, and, and even if you don't make it to the end, you can't go back to work. So the spoilers or whatever. So I'm just like, how did people get that time off from work? Do they quit their jobs? Like, do they take a leave? I, I don't understand. Yeah. I, from what I understand, it's very complicated. Pretty much you're forcing everyone to just put all their eggs in that basket unless they have the kind of job where they can disappear for 40 days. It's, it's pretty, pretty wild. Tricky. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Um, Charlene, it was such a delight speaking with you. I'm so, I'm so glad we got to do it. I hope we do it again at some point. Uh, when does your podcast begin? Well, actually, we've been around for two months. Oh, uh, my God. I'm sorry. That was so no. rude. No, it's not. Uh, episode nine will come out tomorrow. So yeah, two months. We have a, a one episode a week, and All it's right. been it's been a a learning process, and we've been sort of pivoting almost with every episode based on the response. It's I I like as you can see with my blog, I really want it to feel like a conversation with people and want it to feel interactive, and so a lot of the decisions I make are based on what people like and what they respond yeah. to. So. Except for when I switch my blog over to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to check that out. I'm looking forward to it just in a couple of days. Uh, do you have a YouTube channel already set up? Yeah. Well, we have for Dear Shandy, the podcast, we have episodes just in audio form, but we also have YouTube episodes where it's just, it's literally just me and my husband in our living room talking <laughs> with Mike's about our relationships. So uh, that the YouTube channel always like already does exist. And I think I would just add the recaps onto that same channel. I don't sound like I have it figured out and that's because I don't. Well, you can, be, <laughs> you can figure it out as you go along. One of the good things about YouTube, very low barrier to entry, which is one of the reasons why it's so successful. So, really? Is that what they I, say? Um, that's what I say. I don't know if other people say that, but I, that's what I think. Um, Charlene, you it was said great. it with such authority and confidence. I was like, okay, <laughs> but I believe you. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, you just you can upload it from your phone. I mean, you know, then That's of true. course there's much higher quality that you can do, but like, you know, it's like I said, low barrier. Um mm-hmm. anyway, Charlene, it was so great to talk to you. I really enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to your recaps and I hope <laughs> that we'll talk again soon. Likewise, this was a real delight. You lived up to the expectations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. So did you. I'll be I'll be back on Tuesday night after the premiere of Claire's season. It's still Claire. It'll be Clay Show when Tasha comes along. Um, joining me, of course, is Rachel Lindsay. I cannot wait, and I will talk to you then. <laughs> <laughs>